tomorrow. One of these will be a special seminar at 210 in room 152 Science Building. It'll be a sort of a panel discussion. And for other details, you consult the Iowa State Daily for time and place of any other appearances that he will make. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are to hear the ninth Paul L. Arrington Memorial Lecture. It is sponsored by the Iowa State Lecture Committee, by the Fisheries and Wildlife Biology Club, and by the Animal Ecology Group of the Department of Zoology and Entomology. Dr. Arrington came to Iowa State in the early 1930s. His studies in animal biology very soon brought him national and international recognition because of the new concepts which he introduced into this type of investigation. He was an ecologist long before that term came into popular use. He was a naturalist in the best sense of the word. He was a voluminous writer. He had many interests. And among these was a concept that wild creatures had built into them certain mechanisms by which they would respond to nervous and physiological stresses. And these responses in some cases, would control population so that the numbers of any wild species would stay in balance with the space and food restrictions of the environment. Now, sometimes these built-in mechanisms were rather ruthless. And sometimes they would result in rather marked depressions in the population numbers. But this achieved the purpose. And after the numbers had been sufficiently decreased so that the space again become wide enough and the food supply became great enough, then the population could build up again so that we had cyclical phenomena about which he wrote in several cases. Now even before man's present population crunch became critical, Paul Arrington had referred to this possibility in several of his writings. He pointed out that this could eventually become a problem for man. I knew Dr. Arrington as a colleague from the time he came to Iowa State. In recent years, I've wondered what his thoughts might be in comparing the behavior of his wild, dumb creatures in controlling their population problems with man's present attempts, such as abortion and vasectomy and intentional hormonal dysfunctions and by the use of various mechanical devices. Knowing Paul rather well, I think it would be rather intriguing 
and extremely interesting to know what his thoughts about this might be. The wild creatures were able to do it with their innate abilities, whereas man's attempts have been somewhat uncertain, so far at least, in spite of his wisdom and perhaps his misplaced compassion. Our speaker tonight is a well-known playwright, novelist, lecturer, motion picture script writer, and I suspect in some ways one could say he was also involved in rather sharp, critical, scientific investigations. At the present time, in addition to lecturing, he is deeply involved in the preparation of a, of a um, documentary film which will be called Ardres Papers. It will be based upon some of the concepts which he has expressed in his writings. Among his various interests is that of a, an examination of man's populational and environmental dilemmas. Some of his concepts have had a mixed reception by his audiences and his readers, especially among some anthropologists and psychologists and students of human evolution. No doubt these differences will add the salt and pepper and the seasoning to the discussion that we will hear this evening. Our guest is Mr. Robert Ardre, who will address us on the topic of population control. Mr. Ardre. Ladies and gentlemen, I almost left because you were just about giving my lecture. <laughs> I only um, I had known I was coming to Iowa State for quite a while, but I didn't realize until a few days ago that I was giving the Paul Arrington Memorial Lecture. And uh, I received the information with a mixture of intense pleasure and a certain embarrassment. Um, Arrington was one of the first authorities I ever got mixed up with when I was writing African Genesis because there was so little on the literature of predatory behavior, and I was interested in the predatory be behavior of uh, pre-man, of the Australopithecines, the small brain hominids. So in reviewing that lecture, I, uh, that material, I came, of course, on a paper he'd done back in the 40s on the unfriendly relations of mink and muskrats. And I was immensely impressed with it. I was so impressed with it, for the one time in my career, I misquoted the reference in the uh, bibliography and got him into the wrong journal, the right year, the right page number, but whether it was supposed to be the quarterly journal of biology or another one, I forget now. I got it wrong. It's the only time I did it. So I felt that in coming to Ames, I could at least apologize in the right place for having gotten a mess up. <laughs> My admiration for him was immense. And, um, um, and then he, for example, was one of the clearest uh, to define the predator as somebody usually picked up the surplus animals anyway. Uh, back since Darwin's day, there was an idea that predators probably uh, entered into the control of population. And it was Arrington who showed that this wasn't true. 
Many others have seen it too, Fraser Darling and Red Deer, for example, and Moat with the caribou and wolf. But uh, Errington was the first that I happened to run into who had seen this important thing. So that the predator is not part of the control of population. Um, later on in the 50s, I think he wrote that paper in the 40s, in the 50s, his attention was really turned to population control and um, that's where I really started stealing from him. As you'll get in the social contract. Now, I will get back to Errington, who was one of many, many contributors to this subject, but who always seemed to have, you used a very good word when you said he was a, a naturalist, like Conrad Lawrence. <clears throat> he was as much of a thinker as a scientist, almost a feeler as an observer. And I think that's one of the reasons why his writings strike one with such depth. Well, it's necessary to approach the subject with a certain amount of feeling and philosophy, because a big one. We're all caught, caught up in it. I'm glad I'm older than you are. You're going to have lots more trouble than I have, because it's a big future thing. Now, of course, this thing that interested Paul Arrington which was the self-regulation of animal numbers, is today probably as well a documented uh, a conclusion of the new biology as anything you can find. Malthus, I don't suppose Malthus was entirely wrong, but he was mostly wrong. And it was Malthus' idea of population that, that numbers would increase until, uh, uh, geometrically, until they hit the ceiling of food supply, which increased only arithmetically. Well, this doctrine of Malthus, which has haunted us ever since, and which I leads, I believe, to a great deal of the real pessimism about the future of population, our own human population. In other words, if we're going to have um, 30 billion of us someday standing on each other's shoulders. It's pretty depressing. Uh, on the other hand, it's not likely to happen because long before we ever reach that limit of food supply, you really needn't worry. We'll have died of so many other causes. There just won't be that many of us. Animals regulate their own numbers through many varied means to keep themselves, their numbers, within the carrying power of the habitat. That's a very peculiar thing that, as Malthus was wrong, even though he was the inspiration for Darwin and for Wallace, uh, you would not exactly associate Malthus with a neighbor of mine in Rome uh, who is likewise wrong. I. Uh, from my apartment, all my apartment windows, I see the top of St. Peter's over the hill. And I wonder what he's thinking. <laughs> I don't think he's wondering what I think. <clears throat> anyway, they're both wrong. And for different reasons, Malthus for his reason, but animals, or not, or I suppose it must happen in some cases, and you have cli climate catastrophes, which limit numbers. But in the natural way of species, it doesn't happen. In fact, unrestricted breeding is what violates natural law. Natural law is a restriction of your own numbers. And when Pius VI said that contraception was in violation of natural law, let us say that he was badly advised. I want to talk first about the, what I would call a natural controls. There's two kinds of controls in population. One is natural. <clears throat> through a variety of 
physiological and behavioral means, sometimes quite odd, and the other is cyclical, where you build up a certain population, and then if you're sensible, like a muskrat, you just kind of trim it down regularly, or if you're not so sensible, like a lemming, you go and jump in the ocean. Uh, we, unfortunately, far more resemble the lemmings than the muskrat. Uh, let me get at a few species that do it sensibly. Um, It'd be somewhat of a mixed metaphor to say that elephants have us all buffaloed. <laughs> but they certainly do. There's a marvelous example of uh, control that nobody understands, but there it is. In northwestern Uganda, the, where the, Murch the Nile goes over the Murchison Falls, uh, below the Nile, what's known as the Albert Nile, is very wide. It's about one-third water, one-third crocodiles, and one-third hippos. And I find it very unpleasant. And elephants don't find it very pleasant either, so they don't cross it very often. And there are two populations, one on the north and one on the south bank, of the Albert Nile, each about seven or 8,000 in there somewhere, a lot of elephants. But the southern side has been much more crowded uh, particularly since independence and the spread of agricultural land into the area, which restricts the elephants more and more uh, in their uh, living room. Now, uh, there is still plenty to eat. But here you have the po two populations of about the same size, one on the north bank with ample space, one on the south bank with less space all the time. A man named Richard Laws, from an ecologist from Cambridge University, who studied it very carefully. And what has happened has been that in recent years, the elephants on the South Bank, who nor normally space their births about every four years, it's gone to nine years. So you get a baby, a lot, few, uh, a lot fewer babies this thing called menarche, the, when the female is capable of pregnancy, which is normally 11 years, has gone up to 18. Nobody has an idea how they've done it. It's that they've done it. We don't know whether in terms of the reproduction the female fails to come into heat, or males lose the urge for copulation, or they copulate and nothing happens, or whether she gets pregnant and then there's spontaneous abortion, we don't know anything. We just know that that's what's happened to the birth rate there. But there's a, another peculiar example you might look at. You know the little, particularly when you're very young, you usually have a tank of fish around in the guppies, your customs. Uh, Brader, New York Aquarium, had an experiment with guppies. Uh, he didn't know how it was gonna come out, I forget what, what he was trying to get at, but it was certainly not what happened. Uh, with a couple of tanks of um, equal size, one of them he put three males and six females. They usually are in this order of two to one female. And the other, he put one single gravid female who proceeded to have babies. And uh, a peculiar thing in the guppies, they seem to have two or three sets of babies off, all off the same night's entertainment, and the population actually went up. They got up to about 50 in each tank and then began to come down. And finally, in both tanks, you had exactly what you'd started out with in the first tank, three males and six females. Now they had disposed of the young by cannibalism. They just ate them as fast as they came along. How they balanced the books, I do not know. But they did, and they came out the same. Just to pick another very different species. Uh, lions have a very simple means of population control. It's known as neglect of the young. An excellent practice. <laughs> uh, 
neglect of the young and a lie and pride is accomplished very simply. Um, first place, the females, as you probably know, the lionesses do all the work, all the killing, and then the males just sort of sit around and yawn, and when they've got the thing killed, they go up and the females move off and the males eat. Another excellent practice. <laughs> the cubs don't get anything. If a cub tries to get into the chow line too soon, he'll probably get killed by, his, by the adults. Anyway, this is neglect because in those seasons when you have small animals, there isn't usually much left by the time the adults get done, and you have 50% mortality in young lions in the first year. Well, there's a very interesting reason. Once you get a lion up to a couple of years old, it'll probably go on to 13, 15 years. He's got, nobody can kill him, and he's not much susceptible to disease. So if you're going to balance your population, you've got to do it early. This is uh, one of those kind of unpleasant means we were speaking of, but it works. Uh, this is a, in very great contrast to the African hunting dog, who uh, the adults are terribly uh, susceptible to disease, and so the care they take of their young is spectacular. I have watched on a kill where uh, the adults were hungry, there were about 14 half-grown pups. The adults each took one bite out of a 100-pound warthog, stepped back. George Schaller and I watched this for an hour and a half till it got dark, and the adults never took another bite. They left it to the young. Bad practice. Um, another s uh, system of, um, of population control, which is very uh, prevalent in the world, is through the exclusive control of a territory. The breeding group or pair uh, will control an exclusive piece of space, which automatically limits the number of breeders in any given habitat. Uh, this was first, ex well, Elliot Howard was the uh, discoverer or establisher of the principle of territory, which I described in the territorial imperative. and. Um, he did it through observation of many, many species of birds like lapwing, warblers, chaffinch, all sorts in uh, Worcestershire in uh, England. Now, however, earlier, an Irishman named Moffat, an Irish ornithologist, had anticipated it very nicely and had seen that this was a, a form of birth control or a form of po a population control which uh, didn't impress Howard quite as much. And Moffat was right, because it's certainly one of the greatest functions of territory. And distributing your population in such fashion that at least the breeding population is going to have enough to eat. Now, it's true there's some that are left over that don't do very well. Arrington described some of them and the muskrats who were not uh, successful in having territories and breeding. And it was these that the minks dined off so regularly. And that's the reason that the minks didn't have much effect on the, on the basic population. They were hitting the surplus anyway. Now the essence, the territorial principle has many ramifications, but one essence is that the female is unresponsive to a male lacking real estate. I think I have heard of this somewhere. <laughs> it's a kind of a nice system. And it means, however, that the male establishes the territory, such as a robin or a, uh, uh, a, a, any territorial bird, by calls announces not so much that he wants to be loved as that he wants to be admired for his possessions, the female hears the announcement that there's real estate available and comes and joins him. So there they are. Now for quite a while in the discussions of territory which have gone on in the last few decades, um, there was a certain amount of argument as to whether there's really limited numbers because after all, there was a lot of space available. 
I remember Hind at Cambridge questioned it quite severely in a, in a symposium in the 50s saying, there's no evidence that this really limits numbers. It means it spreads them out over the possible uh, habitat, but not necessarily re reduces the numbers. Well, there are some very conclusive arguments came along. B.C. Wynne Edwards, who in my opinion is the greatest coming figure in this field um, at University of Aberdeen in Scotland. One of his little contributions to the argument was simply a photograph that he had taken in Newfoundland of a gannet colony. And there were a couple of headlands. And on one headland, it was white with breeding pairs on their nests. And the other headland was white with unemployed birds. And the thing is that if they couldn't get a territory in the breeding colony, they couldn't breed. In other words, it wasn't just real estate. Some real estate had sexual value and some did not. And this is quite general in bird colonies. So numbers are reduced. Um, um, associate of his at Aberdeen, Adam Watson, did an excellent uh, thing with red grouse. He had to murder a lot of red grouse, but he, there was an area where they had their uh, territories and they were breeding. And um, uh, he labeled all the birds in the neighborhood. He was trying to establish that there were more birds than there were breeders. So then he, the, he collected, as they say, all the um, proprietors and with something like 10 days, every territory had a new proprietor. And they were birds from the vicinity. They just had not been able to breed till they got the territories. Still another was in Australia, uh, Carrick. David Carrick's experiment with magpies. The Australian magpie comes in profuse numbers. And uh, I've never seen them myself, but I understand they're quite a miserable bird to be around. Um, but they, you, apparently people don't have to limit their, reduce the misery of having them around. The magpies do it themselves. Of the whole number of, of magpies in certain few square miles near Canberra that he studied, only 25% were territorial. They got together in groups, defended their territory as a group, and they bred. The rest of them made faint-hearted efforts off in the bushes and things like that, or just stayed in f flocks out in the fields, never bred. Tried once in a while, never successful. Well, now he then came now to close in a little bit on the physiology. And at last, somebody found a reason why, because all these things I'm talking about, nobody's ever understood why. He found, since I'm not entirely why, that uh, 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 uh. Just doesn't ovulate unless she's on a territory. And now you begin to move towards the thing of stress. There's something relaxed about being in your own home. And there the female uh, feels all right about things, and the ovulation takes place. Now, there is no question about this matter of space and, and reproduction. Last week in Washington, I had a glimpse of something I've been hoping to see. Uh, John Calhoun, one of the directors of the National Institute of Mental Health, who did the famous experiment a few years ago with rats, overcrowded rats, which resulted in the phrase behavioral sink. And when they're just, they all become delinquents practically with enough overcrowding. I've been working with mice now for several years. Well, I saw the drag end of the experiment at his place out in Maryland, 
Um, he had built what he called a mouse universe. It wasn't very big. I'd say it was about seven feet square. But it was all arranged with lots of food, lots of water, lots of nests, lots of little metal things which could be made to, for, protected as territories by the males, because the mice were territorial. And for the first few doublings of population took place in a certain length of time, and then the next doubling took place in about twice the time. It was beginning to slow down, and then one day there was no more reproduction. That's when it hit 2,200 mice. It must have been something for Dante to think about what that thing looked like with 2,200 mice in it. When I saw it, there was only 900. That was pretty bad. But there aren't going to be any more mice. These aren't mice anymore. They get any mice habits, mice behavior. They eat, drink, groom themselves, and that's all. And there's none there today that is less than 17 months old because 17 months ago all reproduction stopped and these will never start again. So, in another six months, that will be the end of Calhoun's mouse universe. Something to think about. Too many people. Now the question is, there's a mystery about this thing that I mentioned. How does it work? Well, I guess the answer to it came about through the work of a man named Bruce in Britain. It's known as the Bruce Effect. We discovered the female, uh, you see, the female mouse normally sees no one but the, the overlord, her alpha, the male harem of females with one male. Now she's impregnated, and then she sees a strange male within four days, she spontaneously aborts. And she smells the presence of where a strange male has been in the area. I think the chances are 50-50 that she aborts. Now here's pure overcrowding. If there's too many males around, and there's too many mice around, and the female's answer is to abort. Maybe that's what the elephants do, we don't know. Now this one has been traced down very carefully because everybody was so dumbfounded by it, they began reproducing the experiment with wild mice. He had used uh, laboratory strains. They tried on voles, which are induced breeders, uh, uh, ovulators, uh, who ovulate only after copulation instead of before. Same thing every time, and it's now well understood that it is odor, that there is odor, and the strange odor uh, has a hormonal effect that simply releases the egg in the uterus. We're beginning to understand a little bit about this. Arrington, in his time, uh, there had not been much work done on the physiology, and he was one of the pioneers, because the thing he found, of course, was in the muskrats, the actual number of uh, of fetuses uh, varied with, uh, with the population in decline or ascent, that the, uh, the female mouse had more babies when, you might say, the population needed them. He found this had no relation whatsoever to food supply. This is where Malthus was beginning to crack. Uh, that the cycle was about 10 years and that he with his uh, wonderful gift for simplicity, put it very easily, that years that end in two or three, you get the high population, and years that end in six and seven, you get the bottom. Uh, well, you know, it sounds like the numbers game, but it works, uh, because this cycle is about 10 years. And we'll see how it works with a uh, Swedish lemming thing. But he commented on another thing, which was a Saskatchewan project, and this always has to do with this problem, how much is the environment worth in this situation? Up in Saskatchewan, there was a huge engineering project that must have blocked some streams, made a lot of good marshland for muskrats. Anyway, it increased the habitat and its richness immensely. Uh, the curious thing here was that while it raised the base of how many muskrats you got per acre, it had no effect whatsoever on the fluctuations. 
and in 1946, year ending with six, um, it dived way down to the normal bottom. Didn't even get the raised base. I said the muskrats were sensible creatures because you see, although they go through a cyclical thing, now a lion population in the Serengeti will stay about a thousand year after year after year, it never varies. Uh, here the muskrats would go up and down, but they wouldn't get out of hand. And there would be this self-control by whatever means. Now we have to get around, as we get towards people, we have to get around to the lemming. Lemming has been a very big mystery for a very long time. Um, the observations of the lemming go way back to 16th century. And um, in 19th century, many reports, like some ship going past Trondheim, passes a shoal of dead lemmings, drowned lemmings. It takes them 15 miles to get past. And um, we have known that lemmings periodically take to the drink. D, there's been speculation about it. Darwin thought it, had, it was disease that drove them out of areas. General thought was there's food shortage. And uh, until up in, I think, the 1920s or so, this was, or 30s even, this was fairly well agreed that every so often there was a shortage of food and the lemmings would uh, move out and in the course of it get hysterical and wind up in the sea. However, that began to break down. Observations of lemming movements where there was no food shortage. And there was a famous one in 1963 in Sweden. It was one of the biggest lemming years, as they call them, in this century. You'll notice the number ends with three, as Arrington said it would. He died by then, I believe. I don't think he had anything to do with it. 1963, the lemmings moved down out of the north, and there was ample food, not the faintest shortage. They moved in such numbers as they hadn't been seen. They were counted, they were captured, analyzed. And the interesting thing about it was that these migrating lemmings were all the young of the year. They weren't older lemmings. They were the young of the year. And another interesting thing was that they never came on one sig single pregnant female. It's our old problem. But sex gets turned off when you get this density. And it may even be the new problem that when things get discouraging enough why you have uh, dropouts and youth marches. Couldn't say about that. Could be one way out. Now the investigation became something of a detective story as it moved to Canada and the snowshoe hare. And um, great ecologist Elton uh, studied the snowshoe hare there, which had much the same cycle as the lemming, and came to a most remarkable conclusion. It had something to do with sunspots. He went back through the Hudson Bay records. And uh, of course, the Hudson Bay Company had been buying skins for a couple of centuries. And you had the ups and downs of the lynx. Well, the lynx lives off rabbits. And the lynx, the more the rabbits, the more the lynx. And so they go down. Well, in, over the 200 years, you found these, cy these cycles of about 10 years. And, uh, and also ra enough rabbit pelts to confirm it that in Elton's view, this was associated somehow or other with the sunspot cycle and variations of weather and food supply in the very marginal north. Uh, this, incidentally, Arrington never went for it. But, um, a man named McLulick, who was quite ruthless about such things, went into it a little more carefully and found that in that same period there had been 18 link cycles and 15 and a half sunspot cycles, so it didn't quite come out. And that was the end of the sunspots. 
I don't think incidentally anybody really has an answer on this yet, but you can see that opinion was turning more and more to the problem of density and stress. The populations got bigger, stress got greater, and something happened to the, the physiology. J.J. Um, Christian came up with a fair, very good answer, very interesting answer. He's a very fine scientist. But the answer is, strikes one's a little romantic. Uh, he decided that the, the, the snowshoe hares, as they build up their population, uh, have just too much contact. There's too much strain on the nerves in meeting fresh hares that you haven't seen before. And the goings and the comings and all the encounters of one sort or another. And until you finally get to the critical winter, you get through it somehow, you're worn out, and the March Hare, incidentally, is from Alice in Wonderland, is no joke, because they die at that time in the spring. And Christian says, well, they die when at the end of their rope, they gotta go out and make love. That's a very peculiar answer, but of course it could be. This could be the straw that broke the snowshoe hare's back. Well, we really don't know the answer. It's just one of those marvelous mystery stories that makes biology so much fun. But the stress of numbers has a great deal to do with it. And you also now find studies, as such have been made in Australia, of the rabbit down there, in which you find that the higher rank, the, the, the higher ranking female rabbits under stress of numbers lose many fewer of their young than the lower ranking. The alpha seems to be better equipped. The high status animal seems to be better equipped to meet stress, which led to an absolutely fascinating study that was published a few years ago in the United States of the Bell Telephone Company. And um, the study was made of something like 270,000 workers for Bell Telephone all over the country. And it was an almost perfect laboratory sort of thing because Bell Telephone being Bell Telephone, they've got the same system everywhere, the same ranks everywhere, the same medical records everywhere. And uh, so anything that happened was comparable. Now, we all believe that the people who drop dead of heart attack are the high strivers, the achievers, the fellows who get up there, not at all. Remember the Australian rabbits, and it's the lower ranking females who have the most trouble. The, amongst the workers, the employees of the Bell Telephone Company, workmen, ordinary workmen, had a record per year in terms of deaths from cardiac failure, one sort or another, 4.33 4 per thousand. And on the top executive branch, 1.85. It wasn't the alphas. It wasn't the high achievers who got the heart. It was the lowest ranking workmen. And the only people who were worse off than that were foremen with college degrees. Well, all right, so you get down the problem of man thoroughly. You face this thing that stress is a tremendously limiting factor on population. And you see also what has happened. Somewhere in the expansion of the big brain, one thing or another, whatever were the physiological or behavioral limitations they had, we once had, we've lost them. But for this, we have a cultural substitute known as contraception or abortion. In other words, you can take a rather inhumane answer to the population problem, such as the death by stress that you get in the lemming or the snowshoe hare or many rodents. You can take the rather rugged systems of natural control, like the lion neglecting the young. Or you can have the totally humane system of contraception a biological substitute, a, a cultural substitute 
for a biological command. Well, this is the humane way. I do offer an alternative, though. If we're not going to do it with contraception, in fact, we're not going to control our numbers at all, and they'll get controlled. They'll get controlled as in every other species. But it's going to be messy. One of the things, for example, that we're going to have to start being for is automobile accidents. You see, it's very important to eliminate the breeding group, the young people. And automobile accidents hit the young much harder than older people, and, uh, and automobile accidents will do a marvelous job of, of bringing down the numbers of the breeding population. I'm not part of that breeding population, so we won't worry about me. We have to be for suicide. I'm telling you the things that we'll have to be for if we're not for, for contraception. We gotta be for suicide, particularly student suicide. We must discourage students to a point where they will commit suicide and not have children. Another thing that is absolutely great is women's lib. People ask me what I think of women's lib, and I say, well, I don't know what's going to happen to the women, but it's absolutely marvelous in terms of population control. If a woman would rather go to an office, and why she would rather go to an office, I haven't a clue. Or she must go to an office and not have children, hooray for her. Homosexuality. We have to have far more homosexuality. You take, we only have 4% of Americans really dedicated homosexuals. If we can't get that up to 8%, I don't think we're chill blue Americans. <laughs> Alcoholism is obvious. Drink more. It, under, it undermines the copulating instinct. And, Pornography is likewise good, because the more we have voyeurism and the less we have actual sexual relations, this can't help but uh, do us a bit uh, on the population control. But I want to point one thing out, and that is something I'm not for. I'm not for war, because you kill the men. What's the good? Let's have war between women. That's something different. We'll kill the breeders. <laughs> Well, that's your alternative. I'm not much for it, but I'm just pointing out the things you have to be for if you're not for contraception. I would suggest that you put this up to any of your friends who are not for contraception. More or less, I'm talking about good news. I'm talking about the fact that population control is essentially a natural law. And that those who are for unrestricted breeding stand in the face of natural law violators. Those who stand for restricted breeding stand with it. And my general experience and observation is that the cultural institution that goes along with a biological pattern of long precedent will probably work. If it's private property and goes along with the long precedent of territory, it's probably an institution. You can suppress it, but it takes an awful lot of secret policemen. Generally, these things, you can suppress sex. You can, you can suppress all sorts of things. You want to work hard enough at it. But the great optimistic thing about contraception as a final solution to the population control is simply that it is in line with our animal precedents. I say I regard that as good news. There is something, however, I regard as bad news. And that is my belief that within a generation it must be compulsory. I stated this this summer to the British Family Planning Association in London, Festival Hall. They wanted me to because it was such bad news, tough news, because they're all for voluntary. But the fact of the matter is that voluntary birth control is reverse natural selection. In other words, all those in the population with the greatest foresight, the greatest discipline, 
the greatest social sense and responsibility will control the young, and all those with the least will overbreed. You have even such things as the defect, mentally defective, which in a normal population, human beings, I, rhesus monkeys or chimps or anything, I suppose it's about the same, it's about 3%, about 40, 75% of which are genetic. Uh, it does not really take many generations of multiplication of a defect in a population or a defective uh, ratio to bring on a genetic breakdown. Uh, you see, if you didn't have any birth control at all, the random figures would sort of take care of themselves. But voluntary birth control implies a discriminatory ratio in breeding. It is, in my opinion, impossible. Uh, you take the problem of equality of opportunity, which is the thing we need so badly. There is nothing that suppresses it so much as too many. This frequently, frequently happens in an ethnic group. If in any ethnic group which has a very high number of children in the family, if we're compelled, like everybody else, to stay to two, I think their equality of opportunity would be immediately established. What is swamped, what is always swamped, is the opportunity of the individual in the ambiguity of numbers. We have another point to consider, too. In the old days of individual responsibility, all right, you had 10, you took care of them. Today, society takes care of the young, essential. Sure, we take care of them to a certain age, but there is the public schools, there's public welfare, there's public health. There's even a public policeman to put you in jail one day. Why should one person have more right than another to contribute? to the social responsibility. And I refer to a Robert Kennedy as quickly as to some fellow down around the corner. To my mind, population control must reach a level someday through what means I don't say. This will have to evolve. I don't think it would come within a generation, for example. I think it would come within your, your day, however. Uh, the compulsory control will come about if you are to save the democratic system. And it's peculiar that you come down in the end to an essential slogan, one man, one child. Should one man have more votes than another? Of course not. Why should he have more children than another? And this is about what I believe the long view will challenge us with. And it's a challenge that we will accept or, like many another species, go back to automobile accidents and jumping in the North Sea. Thank you. had your salt, your pepper, and your seasoning for your life. Mr. Ardrey has consented to answer questions from the audience. We know that he will be able to hear those who ask questions, but those in the audience will not be able to hear the questioner. So he will repeat the question before he answers. Are there questions? You better shout, friends, if you're out in the bank. It's a long ways out there in this tilted football field. Uh, should have brought a telescope. I take a nearer one. 